the uh, Neuen Haus tensor. Uh, NJ of normal complex structure, it satisfies. Um, well, so for any uh, vector fields V and W on X, we will have NJ of V comma W. Uh, so this is going to be an equation in vector fields. So NJ uh, is NABC uh, and NJ of V comma W is N a, B, C, V, B, W, C, meaning that you take the vector fields and you contract them with the two downstairs indices uh, in N. Uh, this is going to be equal to uh, the Lie bracket of V and W plus J times big brackets, the Lie brackets of J, V against W plus the Lie bracket of V against J, W. Close big brackets minus the bracket of JV against JW. Um, and this is true for all vector fields V and W in the smooth sections of TX. So uh, this looks quite like the definition I gave of uh, the curvature, or the kind of characterizing property I gave of the curvature and of the torsion um, of connections. Um, so it's well, so it's a fact that the right-hand side involves derivatives of V and W. Uh, so each Lie bracket involves either one derivative of V or one derivative of W, and so on. But all the derivatives of V and W on the right-hand side cancel out. So the left-hand side is pointwise linear in V and W. It doesn't involve any derivatives in v and, of V and W. And so that's a, kind of a property of this complicated expression here. Um, a bit like the curvature being in, depending only on the zeroth derivatives and not the first and second derivatives was the property of the defining expression. Okay, um, so you can think of uh, NJ uh, as like a well, kind of curvature, uh, except um, what is better, in fact, to think of it as the torsion of uh, J. In fact, it is literally the torsion of J, of J in the sense of G structures, GLMC structures. Okay, so there's a big theorem um, about NJ um, called the uh, Newlander Nirenberg theorem, uh, which says that uh, if we let uh, X and J be uh, an almost complex manifold. Uh, so then uh, a necessary and sufficient condition um, for there to exist Um, well, local complex coordinates so I'm going to take X uh, fit inside it I'm going to take a small open set U, let's say a small ball um, then I'm going to take a map um, from U into Z1 up to Zm can be uh, a map from U into C to the M, which are kind of local um, local diffeomorphism. So a diffeomorphism from a small open set in X to a small open set in C to the M, uh, which and these should consisting of holomorphic functions. So each of these, these uh, um, from U and J into C. So I gave you a definition of a holomorphic function on an almost complex manifold. That's what I mean here. 
Um, okay, so necessary condition and sufficient um, condition for there to exist local homo coordinates. Well, this is on well on all of X, meaning that you can cover X by open sets used for which this holds. So necessary and sufficient condition is that. The Neuen has tensor Nj is zero. Okay, so if the Neuen has tensor is zero, we can find such local holomorphic coordinate patches. Uh, if it's not, then we can't. <coughs> uh, so this is like a kind of curvature equals zero condition. It's, it's rather like a, asking for something to be flat. Um, and okay, there's two directions here. One of the directions is actually quite easy. Uh, if you assume there exist local holomorphic coordinates, then you can kind of play with this thing uh, and prove that nj has to be zero. Um, and for example, if there are local coordinates, then you can take v and w to be, well, if, and let's say the coordinates are xi plus iyi, or xj plus iyj, and you take the v's and the w's to be taken out of d by dxj's and d by dyk's and so on. You play with that, you'll find nj is zero. So the easy thing is that if these coordinates exist, then nj is zero. The hard thing is that if nj equals zero, you have to prove the existence of holomorphic functions, of holomorphic coordinates. And so that's a PDE problem. Uh, you have to prove the existence of solutions to this, uh, the, the holomorphic PDE, um, that you know, prove the existence of solutions of the Cauchy-Riemann equation locally, provided that holds. Okay, so then... Holomorphic transition functions between these coordinates and the vanishing of this? Uh, yes, yeah, so that, will, that will be, uh, it will be automatic that um, if, if we take two different coordinate systems which are holomorphic in that sense, then the transition between functions between them is holomorphic. Okay, uh, okay well, so we, we call um, the almost complex structure. J are integrable, uh, and then well, but it's an integral, co almost complex structure, uh, and we also or we just call it a, a complex structure. Uh, if Neuen has tensor N J is zero, uh, and then well, by the uh, and and then. And we call, in this case, the pair uh, x comma j a complex manifold. Okay, so that gives us a second definition of a complex manifold. It's a real smooth manifold together with an integrable almost complex structure. Um, okay, and the claim is that these two definitions of complex manifold are equivalent. So, well, by the Newlander Nuremberg theorem. Um, uh, this is equivalent uh, to the first definition, kind of complex analytic definition of uh, complex manifold. Um, so, oops. Uh, well, so uh, there exist um, holomorphic uh, coordinate charts. Um, Ui, phi i covering x, so by holomorphic, I mean holomorphic <coughs> with respect to j, um, <coughs> and then it turns out that these form a, a holomorphic atlas uh, curly A which is the set of all phi i's, uh, sorry, ui phi i, um, 
for little i in big I, which can basically be the, the set of set of anything. Well, this is really phi i. I'm sorry. Um, that's a different U. Um, with my definition of atlas, the UI would be the image in here, and the phi I would be the inverse map to that. But anyway, um, you can make a, a homomorphic atlas. Um, and conversely, uh, so from A, we can reconstruct J. Okay, so the, the, the two equivalent definitions of complex manifolds. Um, so, well, if we let um, J be an almost complex structure, on X and uh, Nabla uh, be a torsion free connection on uh, TX so then um, well Nabla A of J B C so you take the derivative of the tensor J uh, with the connection, noting we can extend connections from tangent bundle to all tensor bundles. Uh, this and uh, N A, B, C, uh, they are tensors of the same type. They've got two T star X indices, one T X indices, index. Um, and, well, one can show that, or maybe up to, up to a constant factor, nj is a component of nabla uh, j. So that is, um, we can use the almost complex structure to decompose the, the ve vector bundle containing this into various sub-bundles, and nj is the component of it living in one of those sub-bundles. Um, so therefore, so that if um, nabla of j equals zero, then nj equals zero, and um, j is integrable. Okay, so that's going to be important when we uh, get round to talking about the connection between complex structures and holonomy groups. If we've got a holonomy group, uh, H which preserves uh, a complex structure on just on R to the N, then by the connection between holonomy groups and constant tensors there will be a, a tensor, an almost complex structure J on the entire manifold, which is constant under the lever chief to connection of your metric, uh, which is torsion free, and therefore NJ is zero, and therefore J is a complex structure rather than just a normal complex structure. Uh, no. Well, uh, well, the the vanishing of Nabla J is a compatibility condition, if you like. But uh, um, no, and it, I, I'm saying J is an arbitrary almost complex structure. Nabla is an arbitrary torsion-free connection. Then this is true. Yeah. Well, you you might like to. Um, well, if nabla j equals zero, then um, well, if, if that was true, then nabla is compatible with j in the sense that it it it, it also gives you a connection on the uh, GLMC principal bundle, uh, which lives in the frame bundle. Um, but we don't need that. We only need a particular component of nabla j to vanish for this to hold. Um, Okay, uh, what else? Yeah, so another thing, so well, there is a natural notion of a holomorphic map um, between complex manifolds.
So if you take the complex analytic definition, then you end up saying, well, from each you map from a chart in X into X into Y, back into a chart on Y, and then the composition map has to be a holomorphic map between subsets of C to the M1 and C to the M2. Um, for the uh, so you just use kind of standard manifolds, uh, way of defining smooth map for manifolds, but now with holomorphic maps. So in the uh, brackets, almost complex structure definition. Um, a map F going from for X with complex or almost complex structure J into Y with the complex or almost complex structure K uh, is holomorphic uh, if well F going from X into Y is smooth um, and um, well, we can draw a diagram of vector bundles in X, Tx, the root of F, Df, maps you to the pullback F upper star of Ty. Tx can also map down by J to Tx itself, and again we can map by Df into F upper star of Ty. On Ty we have the complex structure K, so you can map down by uh, F upper star of K. So the column square to minus one, there are isomorphisms. Um, so, and, well, basically this square commutes. Uh, in vector bundles on X. Um, so this is essentially a, a Cauchy-Riemann equation. It says that the map DF is complex linear, where the complex structures on TX, uh, the root multiplication J is acting by that the root multiplication by minus one is J here, and the complex um, structure on Ty comes from K. Okay, um, so, well, so then complex manifolds and holomorphic maps form a category. So the composition of holomorphic maps is holomorphic and so on. Okay, so examples of comp complex manifolds Okay, well, some obvious ones the easiest one would be C to the M um, Important examples are the complex projective spaces, CP to the M. Uh, you can make complex tori, uh, T to the 2M, which can be, well, for example, C to the M divided by some lattice, which we could take to be Z to the M plus I Z to the M. Uh, now, in fact, you can you can ver so the lattice here is some additive subgroup isomorphic to z to the 2m to get something compact, um, and you can deform this lattice. You don't have to take it of that form, and you'll get different complex manifolds in general uh, for for different lattices. So these are both compact complex manifolds. Um, more generally. Um, In complex algebraic geometry, um, uh, one can find well huge numbers of um, let's say compact complex manifolds. Uh, 
um, defined uh, as complex submanifolds. of some, let's say, large dimensional complex projective space, CP big N. So in general, if you want to make uh, complex three manifolds, you might want to embed them in some uh, space CPN for N much larger than three, um, defined by uh, the vanishing of some finite collection of uh, homogeneous, well, let's say finitely many um, uh, homogeneous polynomials uh, in the uh, homogeneous coordinates z0, z1, up to z big N of the projective space. Um, and compact complex manifolds of this form uh, are called uh, projective complex manifolds. So one use of algebraic geometry, complex algebraic geometry, in this subject is as a very fertile source of examples. Um, okay. Um, so next we're going to move on to talk about exterior forms on complex manifolds. So we'll have a section 3.2 uh, about uh, exterior forms on complex manifolds. Okay, so uh, well, let's take uh, X and J uh, to be a complex manifold in the sense of the second definition. So X is a real manifold, J is an almost complex structure whose uh, Neuenhaus tensor vanishes. So then uh, it is helpful uh, to consider complex uh, K-forms on X. Um, in other words, uh, sections, let's write them as alpha plus i times beta of the complexified um, bundle of k forms, lambda the k t star of x, tensored over the reals with the complex numbers. Uh, and this is for alpha and beta are real k forms. Okay, so don't get confused by the kind of two kinds of complex complexness going on here. So this business of complexifying the, ten the k forms on X, this works on any real manifold. Has nothing whatsoever to do with the almost complex structure. You can do it for an odd dimensional manifold or whatever. Okay, for any um, real manifold, we can consider complex k forms, which are just pairs of real k forms. Uh, with a alpha plus i beta there. Um, the so this is now a complex vector bundle over the real manifold X. Uh, there's a difference between complex vector bundle and holomorphic vector bundles. 
A complex ve vector bundle is just something that lives on a real manifold, but whose fibers are complex vector spaces rather than real vector spaces. Um, so we're doing this because uh, the complex numbers are algebraically closed, so uh, you can take eigenvalues and eigenvectors of things. In particular, we can take eigenvalues and eigenvectors of J. Um, whereas on the real manifold, uh, on the real vector bundle, uh, you can't necessarily find uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of things because it's R is not algebraically closed. Um, okay, well, so the complex structure big J um, acts on uh, real one forms as uh, J takes uh, T star of X into T star of X um, with J squared is minus 1. So we just do this by contraction of uh, you know, alpha lower B goes to J lower B upper A alpha lower A um, contraction with the tensor indices in the obvious way. Now on complex one forms P star of X tensored over the reals of the complex numbers this is now a complex vector bundle um, this has uh, eigenvalues uh, plus or minus i because j squared is minus one um, uh, and it splits as uh, t star x tensed over the reals with C is a direct sum of two sub-bundles, one of which is the I eigenspace and the other of which is a minus I eigenspace and the convention is to write them as T star of X with a 1 0 direct sum T star of X with a 0 comma 1 for reasons we'll see in a moment uh, where this is the I eigenspace the eigenspace with eigenvalue i and this is the minus i eigenspace okay um, so that's what happens on one forms let's now see what happens on k forms k is more than one um, so then, well, lambda the k t star of x tends it over the reals with c. Uh, these are real k forms complexified. So here, this exterior power here is a, a real exterior power of a real vector space. Um, and perhaps we could bracket it like that. <coughs> so initially we take real K forms and complexify them. <coughs> this is equivalent or isomorphic to um, taking a complex K exterior power of the complexified real tangent bundle. Um, so uh, this is now the complex, this is now a complex vector bundle, and here we're taking exterior powers over the field C rather than over the field R. This is now lambda the k C of, well, we now know that this splits as a 1, 0 plus a 0, 1 forms. Okay, so this is now the complex exterior power of a direct sum of the two things. And an exterior power of a direct sum of two things uh, splits as a direct sum over all P and Q greater than zero with P plus Q is equal to K of 
lambda p c of t star 1 comma 0 of x tensored over the complex numbers with lambda q c of t star 0 comma 1 of x brackets um, So I'm decomposing my vector, complex vector bundle of complex k forms on x into a direct sum of complex subbundles indexed by natural numbers p and q which add up to decay. Um, so we define this to be direct sum of p plus q equals k of lambda p comma q p star of x, so uh, by which I just mean that I'm going to write lambda pq of t star of x for this complex vector bundle here. Okay, um, so here sections of this bundle lambda p comma q uh, of t star of x are called P comma Q forms. Okay, um, so what I'm saying here is that on the complex manifold, you complexify the K forms. Uh, it's then natural to break the K forms up into pieces indexed by P and Q, where P plus Q equals K. Um, so, in fact, well, so you can actually do this in terms of eigenspaces. So you might think uh, that j squared should be minus 1 everywhere, so the only eigenvalues should be allowed for j are i and minus i. But actually that's a Lie group thing. So if you think about j as living in, in a Lie group, then j squared is minus 1. Really, you should, for this point of view, you should think about j as living in the Lie algebra of um, what GL m comma r uh, to, at gl to m comma r rather than the Lie group um, and then you can get a, a Lie algebra action of the Lie algebra gl to m comma r on uh, the k forms here or complexified k forms and then actually this thing is the the eigenspace of j uh, with eigenvalue i times p minus q. Okay, so in the case k equals 1, um, either you have 1, 0, in which case you get eigenvalue i, or 0, 1, in which case you get eigenvalue minus i. Uh, so, um, so these things, they are in fact eigenbundles uh, with eigenvalue p minus q times i, uh, pr but you have to do something slightly non-obvious to, to make j act on uh, on the bundles, um, and when you do so, j doesn't square to minus 1 on the k forms uh, as you might have expected. Okay, uh, well, as to what pq forms look like, that's actually fairly easy. Uh, if uh, z1 up to zm are uh, local holomorphic coordinates. on x, um, with respect to j, then the d of zi's are complex 1 forms, because they're, I don't know, dxi plus i dyi, whatever. Um, they're not real 1 forms, they're complex 1 forms. Also they're complex conjugates, d of zi bars are also complex 1 forms. So the d zi's are 1, 0 forms, the d bar zi's are 0, 1 forms. Um, and so you can see that uh, dz j1 wedge dot 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 wedge dz jp wedge dz bar k1 wedge dot 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 wedge dz bar kq uh, these are pq forms uh, and they are in fact a basis of sections 
uh, of, well, in fact, uh, well, local basis of sections of lambda p comma q p star of x, uh, and this is taken uh, for well, the, J, the J's and the K's run over everything they could. So one less than or equal to J1, less than dot dot dot, less than JP, less than or equal to M, and one less than or equal to K1, less than dot dot dot, less than KQ, less than or equal to M again. So, um, any locally, any p comma q form can be written as a, a sum of complex functions times those uh, kind of standard basis p q forms. Any questions so far? Um, Okay, so, so far, all this decomposition of k-forms is good for an almost complex manifold. You don't actually need the almost complex structure j to be integrable. The next thing I say does need that. So it turns out that, uh, well, um, d of, well, p comma q-forms Is contained in um, p plus one comma q forms direct sum p comma q plus one forms. Um, well, at least for integrable j. So there's another interpretation of the if you've got a general most complex structure j. There's another interpretation of the new land of the Neuenhaus tensor NJ, which is that a D of a P comma Q form, it can also have components in P plus P plus two Q minus one forms, and in P minus one Q plus two forms, and the Neuenhaus tensor is the thing which determines the maps from PQ forms into P plus one Q P plus two Q minus one and P minus one Q plus two forms. So, uh, if the Neuenhaus tensor is zero, then those maps uh, are zero, and these live only in here. Okay. Um, so uh, we can write. Uh, it helps to be a laser printer at this point. So straight D, the, the ordinary Dirac D, which is a kind of Roman D, is a partial D plus a partial D bar. Um, so a kind of curly D, curly D bar. Um, so Dirac D splits as two pieces, uh, where curly D maps P comma Q forms to P plus one comma Q forms. So this is a kind of holomorphic part. It, in, it increases the complex linear, the holomorphic form, degree by one. Um, and D bar is a kind of anti-holomorphic bit. Uh, this maps P comma Q forms to P comma Q plus one forms. Um, okay, so so we know that for Dirac forms uh, we have, or for the Dirac differential, we have Roman d squared equals zero. Um, if that tells you that curly d plus curly d bar squared is zero, um, and if you think about it, uh, you'll see uh, that we get. Um, curly d squared plus uh, equals zero. Uh, well, curly d bar squared equals curly d bar squared equals d d bar plus d bar d is equal to zero. 
point. So initially, d squared equals zero tells you that the sum of these three terms is zero. Okay, but actually, this thing um, maps you from PQ forms into P plus two comma Q forms. That thing maps you from PQ forms into P comma Q plus two forms. This thing maps you into PQ forms into P plus one Q plus one forms. So each of these three pieces in the things which add up to zero <coughs> map you into different spaces. So you can deduce that each of these separately vanishes. Um, so that's a useful thing. What you've got is a double complex, basically. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to write big omega p comma q as the set of smooth sections of pq forms. So that's a, a complex vector space, as this is a complex vector bundle. Um, so, so that um, curly D maps omega P comma Q into omega uh, P plus one comma Q, and curly D bar maps uh, omega P comma Q into omega P comma Q plus one. Okay. Um, so, well, a a map, uh, a smooth map, F going from X or X comma J into C is is a zero zero form. zero forms are just smooth functions um, in therefore lies in the game of zero zero and if you work out what the definition means um, it turns out that f is holomorphic uh, if d bar of f equals zero Okay, so well, d bar of f is kind of the anti-holomorphic part of the, you know, the, the complex conjugate linear part of the derivative of f. So if d bar of f is zero, then uh, the derivative of f is holomorphic, or is complex linear, so it's a holomorphic function. Um, so that means we kind of prefer the operator d bar to the operator d, uh, because uh, you know, d bar vanishing gives, tends to give us holomorphic things, which we like rather than anti-holomorphic functions, for example. Um, so that's why if, you, if you're going to use one of D or D bar, you usually use D bar. Um, when we supposed to stop? Let's stop now. Let's, let's, let's just define Dolbo Kermode groups first. So the, the Dolbo cohomology groups Uh, are H P comma Q lower D bar of X, which is the kernel of the D bar operator going from P comma Q forms on X into P comma Q plus one forms on X, divided by the image of D bar going from uh, P Q minus one forms on X into P comma Q forms on X. Um, <coughs> so they make sense because D bar squared equals zero. Uh, so the, kernel, the image is contained in the kernel and they uh, generalize uh, Diram cohomology groups. So this is a finer invariant to demand Durham groups, and so there is a relationship between Durham groups and uh, Dolbo groups. In fact, there's, there's some kind of a, a spectral sequence going from these guys to the um, 
uh, the Durham cohomology groups. But it will turn out that for compact Kähler manifolds, that spectral sequence degenerates. So basically, these are pieces of um, Durham cohomology. Um, but you know, th so the the dimensions of the Durham groups give you invariant spetty numbers depending upon one integer k. Dimensions of the Dolbo groups give you invariants depending upon two integers p and q. Uh, so there's, there's more information in, in these somehow. Okay, um, so